Welcome to episode 60 of Lucretius Today. I am your host, Cassius, and together with my panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius's poem, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. For anyone who is not familiar with our podcast, please check back to episode one for a discussion of our goals and our ground rules. If you have any question about that, please be sure to contact us at epicureanfriends.com for more information. In this episode 60, we'll continue our discussion of the mind's use of images. Our text comes from Latin lines 907 through 1036 of book four. Now let's join the discussion with Charles reading today's text. Next, how soft sleep dissolves the limbs in rest and frees the mind from anxious care. I choose in few but sweetest numbers to explain, as a swan's short song is more melodious than the harsh noises of cranes scattered by the winds through all the air. Hear me, my Memmius, with a ten of ears and a discerning mind, lest what I shall prove you think impossible to be, and so your mind, refusing to admit the truth I shall relate, You make no progress in philosophy, when the fault is in yourself that you will not see. And first, sleep comes on when the power of the soul, diffused through the limbs, part of it is thrown out and fled abroad, and part being squeezed more close, retires further within. Then are the limbs dissolved and grow weak. For without doubt, the business of the soul is to stir up sense in us, And since sleep removes, we must conclude that the soul is then disturbed and driven abroad. Not the whole soul, for then the body would lie in the cold arms of eternal death. Then no part of the soul would lie retired within the limbs, as a fire remains covered under a heap of ashes. From whence the senses might be kindled again through the body, as a flame is soon raised from hidden fire. But by what means this wonderful change is brought about, how the soul is thus disordered, and the body languishes, I shall now explain. Do you see that I do not scatter my words unto the wind? And first, the outward surface of bodies, which are always touched by the adjacent air, must of necessity be struck by it and beaten with frequent blows. And for this reason, all things almost are covered either with skin or bristles, or shells, or buff, or bark. This air, then, as it is drawn in and breathed out by respiration, strikes upon the inward parts of the body, since therefore the body is beat upon from within and without, and since the stokes pierce through the little pores into the seeds and the first principles of it, this cause a kind of ruin and destruction through all the limbs. The situation of the seeds, both of the body and mind, are disordered, so that part of the soul is forced out, and part retires and lurks close within, and the part that is diffused through the limbs is so broken and divided that the seeds cannot unite to perform their mutual operations, for nature stops up all the passages of communication between them, and therefore the regular motions being exceedingly changed, the sense is entirely gone. Since therefore there is not a power sufficient to support the limbs, the body becomes weak, all the members languish, the arms, the eyelids fall, and the knees sink under the weight of the body. Thus sleep follows when the belly is full, because food, when it is distributed through all the veins, has the same effect upon the soul as the air had, and that sleep is by much the soundest which you take when you are weary or full, because then more of the seeds, being agitated and put into motion by the hard labor, mutually disturb and disorder one another, and for this reason the soul retires further within, and a greater part of it is thrown out, and the parts that remain within are the more separated and the further disjoined. And then the business we more particularly follow, the affairs we are chiefly employed in, and what our mind is principally delighted with when we are awake, the same we are commonly conversant about when we are asleep. The lawyer is pleading of cases and making of statutes. The soldier is fighting and engaging in battles. The sailor is warring against the winds. For myself, I am always searching into the nature of things and writing my discoveries in Latin verse. And so, many other arts and employments are commonly the empty entertainments of the minds of men when they are asleep. 
and they who spend their time in seeing plays for many days together, when those representations are no longer present to the waking senses, there still remain some open traces left in the mind, through which the images of those things find a passage, so that for many days after the whole performance is acting over again before their eyes, and even while they are awake, they fancy they see the dancers leaping and moving their active limbs, and hear the speaking strings, they see the same audience, the same variety of the scenes and decorations of the stage. So strong impressions do use, and custom make upon us, such effects to the common business of life produced in the minds of men, and beasts likewise. For you shall see the gallant courser, when his limbs are at rest, to sweat in his sleep, to breathe short, and, the barriers down, to lay himself out, as it were on the full stretch for the prize. And hounds frequently in their soft sleep throw out their legs, and of a sudden yelp and snuff the air quick with their nose, as if they were full cry upon the foot of the deer. And when awake they still pursue the empty image of the game, as if they saw it run swiftly before them, till undeceived they quit the chase, and the fancied image vanishes away. And the fawning breed of house dogs that live at home often rouse and shake the drowsy fit from their eyes and start up of a sudden with their bodies as if they saw a stranger or a face they had not been used to. The sharper the seeds are of which the images are formed, they strike in the sleep with the greater violence. So many birds will fly about and hide themselves in the inmost recesses of sacred groves by night. If in their soft sleep they see the hawk pursuing them upon the wing or pouncing or engaging with his prey. Thank you for reading that section, Charles. It's longer than normal, but it's generally addressing the issue of what happens when we're asleep and in dreams and so forth. So it was good to keep this section together. Some of the Physical description, obviously, is obsolete of the soul withdrawing deeper into the body and things like that. Does he get uh, to how it gets back in? (laughs) I don't know that I... Yeah. Yeah. Do you, like, like make new... I like, whoa, whoa, what has happened to the soul wandering abroad? (laughs) Well, yeah, and and, and actually, the idea of any part of it leaving the body is kind of strange to me under the general theory we've been discussing, but... Does that that's kind of what he's saying, isn't it? That yes, the, uh, it is. He just didn't explain what maybe maybe the next section has to do with what happens when you wake up or I haven't looked. No, at it. I don't think no? so. I don't he think he comes that back out. to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I were Mimius, I'd be saying, hey, whoa, wait, how does it get back? Well, or maybe there's something there back about what the soul really is and whether he he seems to flip flop sometimes as if he's talking about sort of what we would think of as the electronic impulses or something. I don't know whether oh, he he's... pretty much consistently talks about it as being seeds, but just very, very fine. Yeah. So you can lose some of your seeds maybe without obviously you can cut off. But you Does couldn't he... lose them every night and not get new ones. Well, does he say that? I can't remember if he says that the soul is in every part of the body. Like if you cut off your hand or something, do you lose part of your soul when you cut off your hand or is that just the spirit? Because he kind of goes back and forth between those two words, soul and spirit, which confuses me. Because I think he does say that like the spirit, you, you have part of your spirit in all parts of your body, right? The soul is what he said you have in all parts of your body. I think he pretty much consistently uses soul in the ways that we would think about the peripheral nervous system, but as particles and not as electronic in, impulses, because he, you know, he didn't have that. So, well, this is um, a different this is a different path than I intended to talk about. But maybe Wes, we should for a second more. Elaine, are you seeing a difference between soul and spirit? And what are you saying? You'd have to is? find me where you are talking about with spirit, because what I and I can't remember a specific passage, but. It seems to me like that's more connected with feeling and not with particles. Right. Um, but but the the soul every to my memory every time he's used it has been very consistent. It's consistent here. And when he talked about death, one reason he said you know we can't persist is that when the soul leaves, it's dispersed over this. You know, there's nothing to hold it together. There's no skin to hold it together, and it wouldn't be able to find its you know the the particles to find their way to each other so the person can't exist anymore so i'm real curious now if you lose something every night when you go to sleep how do you reaccumulate your soul particles 
Well, that would imply that there's some doesn't doesn't that kind of discussion imply that there's some kind of critical mass of soul that you can lose some, gain some maybe, but you Yeah, but have you'd have certain... to have a way to regain it. You know, because mm-hmm. you wouldn't have a he he talks about humans being finite. You wouldn't have an infinite number of particles inside of you or or you would be, I guess, in his scheme immortal somehow but but you uh if you lose them you're going to have to get them back so you, you he's saying some of you some of the soul kind of retreats into the middle of the body and hides out is not in the limbs anymore and some of it leaves completely so the part that is retreated wouldn't be the same amount of soul you'd have to get your get it back maybe Maybe just random soul bits are supposed to come back through your skin and well, get organized. He, <laughs> you, you know, he's, he analogizes it to the fire within the ashes. So maybe there's an part of the answer there is that the fire can die down and, and yet rekindle itself when it gets more material to work with. Maybe there's something going on there. Yeah, it would have to have new particles because his soul particles, the seeds are different. It's mm-hmm. not like you could turn a blood particle into a soul particle. So, um, yeah, I guess he just left that out. He probably was, maybe, maybe he was, maybe it's somewhere else, maybe. Right. Martin or Charles, any comment on that part? Not really. Without doubt, the business of the soul is to stir up sense in us. So it's almost like soul is a catalyst or something. But at any rate, he leaves that first passage by saying that don't let my words just scatter themselves into the wind. Uh, I guess. He's yeah, talking. he really he wants sure. Mimius to believe this part. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's it's too bad that it's not right. But it's real. It's it's real. It's again, it's very creative. It's, it's fascinating. It's an attempt to explain sleep in a material way. I want to remember that that. So I don't know what the other, let's say there was late day, the, the goddess of sleep. Am I correct on that? Oh, um, Charles, you're usually good on that. I think yeah, you're right. I'm not sure. You know, but while you're looking for that, Charles, another comment. Yeah. That are, you go ahead. Then you found it. It's a river. It was a river. Lethe was one of the five rivers that flowed through the underworld in Greek mythology, passed through the cave of Hypnos, sleep. So, but I don't, I don't know if that was the explanation for people going to sleep, like mm-hmm. not in the right. underworld. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're dealing with this in the context of other explanations that were going on at the time for sleep. Right. So it would be interesting to know what those were. Right. I'm thinking of that river too as being what the people drink from. Well, is it when they come into the the river of forgetfulness? You yeah. think of that when you die or when you're born or both? Well, they didn't have reincarnation, so it would just be after born. you die. Well, maybe. I think some of them believed in reincarnation, but I don't think the, the majority Greeks? of them did. I think there were Greeks who were – because, you know, because you know, Elaine, that's what this whole platonic theory of remembrance was about in terms of that you're remembering your past life it is this theory of knowledge that's tied into the issue of ideal forms is that I, I think that Plato was kind of in that same boat. Well, that, but no, was it around and around reincarnation incarnation, or you started off there and then right. like, that's you know, a good which question. is a different. I think the Pythagoreans were, it would be an example of somebody who would end a reincarnation, but I'd have to look that up to be sure. That sounds about right. I remember something. Yeah, actually that, yeah. Metempsychosis is another word that goes with that. Pythagoras, it looks like, believed in metempsychosis or reincarnation, according to Stanford Encyclopedia. There is another one, too. Empedocles. Okay, yeah, I had forgotten so that, about that with Pythagoras. That's why I made the comment about maybe you drink of the river before you're reborn or whatever, but I'm not sure. I'd have to look into all that. So, but I wonder what was the explanation for sleep besides a Yeah, purist? right. I don't know that I'm, I'm going to come up with an answer for that. It would probably else. not be a material thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I say hypnos, the god of sleep and dreams, remover of all pain, suffering, and sorrow. So it would be a god. A god would be involved. Um, and uh, so here's a material explanation of sleep that doesn't involve a god. 
Elena, and when you read that about that particular God, that's close to what I was about to say, is that I think I'm reading in this second paragraph of what we're reading that Lucretius is talking about sleep as not something that's necessarily good or restorative, but disruptive. He's talking about... yeah. That, that's something that's counterintuitive, I think, for most of us, because I think we would presume that sleep is rest, which yeah. it is most of the time. But this description of what's going on with the seeds is really a disruption of the normal operation of the soul. Exactly. Like. Yeah, I noticed that, too. And also this thing about the body being beaten by blows constantly yeah. is, is, a, is a real, really kind of violent view of experience and like finally you just can't take it anymore now i have had days where i might say that that made sense as a metaphor mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah and I need, but but still i would think of sleep not as the culmination of disorder but as as a restorative process yeah i mean i can see how you know you can't keep laboring on forever they eventually you'll have to sleep and so that could be a dis- disruption to that but still yeah, just to just seeing this in here would put me on alert that maybe there might be other passages or other aspects of Epicurus's thought that were not completely positive about sleep, that maybe uh, certainly there has to be a rest aspect of it that anybody I mean, would acknowledge. how does it end, right? I mean, if it's yeah. brought about by disorder and itself is a state of lost connections, blocked connections, things not functioning the way they're supposed to, then what puts it back? That's, yeah, my, that's a good basically question. my same question about where yes. does the soul come back from? Um, yeah. yeah. Could be is there- the seeds rebuilding themselves. I mean, the guess is as good as any. There's not a lot of material on dreams. I do want to point out that this continues to support my understanding of what he's saying about the images that they are not, that they're still coming from outside, even the images of the lawyer and the soldier. And let me go to, so Brown says, this is in the third section, there still remain some open traces left in the mind through which the images of those things find a passage. And then Monroe, there yet remain passages open in the mind through which the same idols of things may enter. So I, you know, we were kind of leaving that open about how, how Lucretius was describing that, but this still seems real consistent with what I said is that it, it's a, they're not from the mind but there are passages uh, for them to come through from the outside. All I can say is I'm not persuaded yet <laughs> that it's really? completely that way. No, I'm not. I, I have to think that the, the fact that the lawyer is, for example, the lawyer is dreaming of, of his causes or his cases has to have some, there's something about his past experiences that lead him to, be dreaming about those particular things. Well, he says and, that. He says there are well, passages. But yeah, the well, actual image, he says, is coming from the outside. Well, Three, see, where does he say that the image is coming from outside? Outside, I don't see there. I, I would think you, I'm not convinced yet that we don't see Oh, because images, he's already frankly. said that in a previous, he said that in a previous section where he talked about the dream images coming through the, through the pores directly into the mind. He's well, already said th- that. And my view would be that some of them do, but I also am not he convinced that we don't that. store images. See, see, I'm still on the storing images issue, which I may be persuaded to abandon at some particular point, but I'm not persuaded yet to abandon the fact that I think we can, that we receive images from outside, and I'm thinking that we also store them. But again, so I, we I, don't I, store them. You know, we know that from my. What, what, why do we know that? Why do we know that? So there's there's it's I don't pretty complicated, <laughs> but yeah, I will find you some references because okay, that's well, a you're, common uh, popular idea, but it's not okay, how the brain works. Okay, well that's you. We have to distinguish there then that that's your view of the way things really are versus the way Epicurus was looking at. Right, it. and I don't. I, Epicurus didn't have that. I mean, it's, it seems glaringly clear that every time he's described it. He's talking about images. He's spoken about images coming through the pores. He's talking about them finding a passage. He has never said that we store images. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the issue. That's the issue. And I'm, I'm not yeah. going to really disagree with you that the weight of what we're reading right now 
is is clearly that he's talking about images from the outside. And and I, I relate that to the exchange between Cassius and Cicero, where Cicero is saying exactly what you're saying. Did, was I thinking about you because an image of you floated through the mind to me or, or for some other reason? So clearly there's a large component of the images coming from outside. I just don't know how you can eliminate images from within being stored. But uh, again, you, you may be right about that. I, that's one of those things that I will hold in suspense anyway. Yeah. On that um, part about them not being stored accurate, he's just not accurate about images coming from the outside. We're going a long ways without comment from Martin. Martin. <laughs> yes. You're with us, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, so uh, I, I agree that uh, counter what partly what we think today that uh, there is no mentioning of any memory function, uh, or at least no direct memory function. So the only thing what we can put together is uh, together with this section and the previous section that uh, the mind is then conditioned to select what we are interested in, so or what we deal with. No? So like. A lawyer who works uh, all the time on law when he dreams he is, is then also looking for images coming uh, related to law. And that's what he sees in his face. And, 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 so, and so in that sense, a lawyer or a sailor would be just kind of conditioning their mind's focusing habit so that it's continuously focused in a particular direction. Yes. <clears throat> As opposed to being... Uh, and that would be the method by which the prior experiences cause it to select new experiences. That may be, and I, and I certainly see a large component of, of that in here. So I don't want to monopolize anything here by suggesting that any resistance I have to it has to be resolved at the moment. Where are we? We're in the middle of the second passage, maybe. Probably nobody would question his commentary that sleep is the deepest when the belly is full or when you're the most tired. That's probably pretty yeah. uncontroversial. And the reason, and for this reason, the soul retires further within and a greater part of it is thrown out. And the parts that remain within are the more separated and the further disjoined. I mean, that's just another citation for the sleep being sort of a disruptive process. Right. Let's see. I found the uh, the sections from the uh, the inscription that talks about dreams. What have you got there, Charles? Uh, okay, it's it's a little long, but it kind of explains it. We probably ought to include it if you got can you read it. Yeah. Uh, and often mirrors too will be my witness that likeness and appearance appearances are real entities for what I will say will certainly not be denied at all by the image which will give supporting evidence on oath and not a continual flow being borne from us to the mirrors and indeed bring back an image to us for this too is convincing proof of the effluence seeing that each of the parts is carried to the point straight ahead now that images that flow from objects by impinging on our eyes cause us both to see external realities and through entering our soul to think of them, so it is through impingements that the soul receives in turn the things seen by the eyes, and after the impingements of the first images, our nature is rendered porous in such a manner that, even if the objects which it first saw are no longer present, images similar to the first ones are received by the mind, creating visions both when we are awake and in sleep. That is interesting. And let us not be the last part. Yeah. And let us not be surprised that this happens even when we are asleep, for images flow to us in the same way at that time, too. How so? When we are asleep with all of the senses, as if it were paralyzed and extinguished again in sleep, the soul, which is still wide awake and yet is unable to recognize the predicament and the condition of the senses at that time, on receiving the images that approach it, conceives an untest untested and false opinion concerning them as if we were actually apprehending the solid nature of true realities, for the means of testing the opinion are asleep at that time. These are the senses, for that rule and standard of truth with respect to our dreams remain these. And then, the means of testing the opinion remain asleep? Yeah, are asleep at that time. And then he goes on to um, oppose Democritus by saying that dreams are God-sent. Clearly, I would read what you just I hear what you're just reading to support what Elaine is saying. Mm -hmm. that that's 
is, are you still there, Elaine? Yeah, I'm here. I'm listening. Yeah, clearly that supports what she's saying that uh, yeah. that the experience of seeing things conditions your passages almost like it's tuning them so that it's going to be seeing something similar in the future. Right. Now, where I would want to inquire is to when he's talking about that the means of testing them are sleep. I don't know what he's talking about there, because I, I would think part of the means of testing what you're seeing would be to compare them what you've seen in the past, which would be memory to me. But I don't know. Well, I mean, these days I would say it's your executive function, you know, um, but um, but I don't, I don't know what he meant exactly. It seemed like it would be something similar to that. Your frontal lobes. Well, I, I can certainly I'm still thinking through what Charles read. I, I can certainly see that your means of testing them. I mean, our means of testing what we see is to look further, maybe. But but I presume that at some point you have to store your past observation in order to compare it to the current observation or you'd never have anything but your current observation. Presume well, it's that- um, so and, and there is still research going on about, you know, image processing and memory and imagination but it's more like there's a like what modern uh, martin said before there's a there are neurologic patterns you know that that get created which you could metaphorize as passages but he literally was saying passages where physical objects were passing through which is not the same but anyway we 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 get this neurologic patterns by which we sort of recreate our experience of an image or create an experience of a new imaginary image but they're not coming from outside nor are they like in some kind of a image file it's distributed widely over over the brain and it's it's recreated when when you see it from these patterns. Well, Elaine, when he talks about passages, uh, I yeah. can see an analogy. Uh, wh- how, oh, how it's we... analogous. I mean, you could metaphorize it, but he literally was talking about a well, material process. Well, but that's but that's where I'm going with memory and with the brain. I mean, uh-huh. in, ultimately, the brain is a physical object, right? Does it maybe yeah. is passages really a? I mean, it. I'm not so sure in my mind that passages doesn't strike me as a better physical description than a pattern does. I mean, the brain can't really store patterns, can it? Well, what's no. the brain storing? Digits? Yes, the brain can 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 store patterns. Yes. So how how electrically um, uh, an assembly of synapses in some way, or what are you suggesting? Is yeah, it's the, like a pattern of neural firing. So, I mean, there are obviously, you could say passages would be the neuron connections, but that is not what he's talking about. He is talking about literal material images coming from outside the body, going through like tunnel, like, like, you know, passages. And that isn't what happens. It comes from inside the brain. I don't profess to have any answer. So I have no response to that. Anybody else? And I think we're about three quarters of the way through this passage. So anybody can pick up anything anywhere here. No, and um, that that section in the inscription is more so about how dreams of cells um, can often feel real and convincing. And that's what he's saying about how the means to actually test that are asleep, meaning the senses. Meaning the senses are asleep as mm-hmm. opposed to the processing function being asleep. That yes. Is, I think that's an int- it would be interesting to parse out what it is that's asleep and not functioning versus what it is. Yeah. Is he saying that it's the mind's direct receipt of these images from the outside that is not asleep while the hearing, seeing, and the five senses are asleep? Or is he uh, saying that it's the mental opinion-making function that's asleep? He says that it's the soul, which is still wide awake and yet is unable to recognize the predicament and condition of the senses at the time. And says that the soul itself conceives that false opinion. I'm not so sure I, I'm clear on what it is that's asleep when when you're asleep. Is it the Are the senses asleep? Because yes, you can... Yes. It, 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 go, go ahead. In Lucretius, you use the senses. Uh, in Lucretius, you use the senses as sleep. So the soul, soul has been withdrawn from the from the limbs where our senses are, 
and uh, but but uh, in the core where the soul is, that that is still awake. No? But it can't do much because it doesn't receive input from the senses. It receives only those images from outside these idols. That sounds reasonable to me. But I'm trying to think back if I can remember where he's saying that the. I mean, like the, I guess it would be clear that the eyes kind of go out of functioning because your eyelids are closed. But don't you still hear and sense touch? Well, you do, but I don't know if he thinks you do. He, he thinks not. Uh, I, mean, I think and, he and, thinks and, not. I think he thinks it's all turned yeah. off. Yeah. And that if yeah. you're getting stuff like that, it's probably coming through your pores and not through your sense organs. Mm-hmm. But with the mind, in his theory, being a sense organ of its own, receiving things directly, why is that not asleep, too? Well, he didn't say why. I think he was just trying to make observations. Mm-hmm. And what would explain the, the lawyers' and the soldiers' dreams would be, if that's what they're immersed in, they would have more exposure to those images. And so there'd be more traces of it. Okay, and here's a passage into what is the third paragraph. And they who spend their time in seeing plays for many days together when those representations are no longer present to the waking senses, there still remain some open traces left in the mind through which those images, through which the images of those things find a passage. Right. So that for many days after the whole performance is acting over again before their eyes, even while they are awake, they fancy they see the dancers leaping and moving their active limbs and hear the speaking streams. And uh, Monroe and Bailey both translate that as passages instead of traces. Hmm. So strong impressions do use and custom make upon us. Such effects do the common business of life produce in the minds of men and beasts likewise. So clearly you could say that he is saying that the experience tunes you to receive certain images. Right. And that and the and images that, are already out there. Like he's, yes. he's already said they're constant. They're all around us all the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And so these passages are giving preferential access to particular images. So, I mean, you could, could you extend that and say that that is his full description of memory? That memory is the tuning of your passages? And that's all that he's given so far. And I don't know why and he hasn't seen a need to add any other explanation. I mean, I think he's been, it seems extraordinarily clear cut. Um, whereas he's left out, like, how do you wake back up? <laughs> from sleep, how do you get your soul mm-hmm. particles back? This part, I don't find to be vague at all. I think he's been real straightforward, and he hasn't said there's a need for any other explanation that this is how it works. Well, the part the part that I'm going to have to just continue to p- turn over in my mind is I, I think all this makes a very reasonable explanation for what's going on in dreams and hallucinations and events of everyday life. But I I don't see him having this theory as requiring a wholesale rejection of any other mechanism of memory. I would, I could think that they would, they could peacefully coexist, but I'm not prepared to say that. So, I mean, when he talks about having seen things that you've seen, uh, having seen a play, and the images find a passage, you wouldn't think that that's memory? That sounds like memory to me. Well, that's what I'm saying. You could expand this to just to take over the entire function of memory. Uh, yeah. You, there is no need for any. You could you if you could extend this far enough that there is no function, there is no mechanism of memory other than the tuning of your of your mind to receive certain images more than others. Right. I mean, why would you need another explanation? I mean, the way he set it out, he's he's kind of explained, even though it's not right, he's explained it thoroughly and materially. You know, his model didn't leave anything out in this instance where you would need something special for different for one kind of memory versus another kind. I, I don't I don't see any confusion on his part about that or or like like he's reserving something out to the side. Just the mainly I'm saying that because he he was real clear in talking about these images just that we're constantly surrounded by them. They're always out there and there would never be any shortage of whatever image that you wanted to think of. You would decide you want to think of it and boom, there that, you know, you would see that image because you had made a decision to see it. So 
why why would you need anything different for memory? I just see that as too much of a stretch of his physics uh, in terms of there being. I mean, there there are limitations in his physics to me of what can be and what cannot be. A lot of limitations of what can and cannot be, and to extend the idea that all images of every possible thing are just constantly in every location where a human being could be, that seems to me further than I can imagine Epicurus didn't he, going. Didn't, didn't he pretty much say that? Well, I, did, I thought I, that's I, what I, he said in a previous section that we... Uh, yes, see. that's what he said. That's These exactly are very fine said. particles. These uh-huh. particles are very fine, and so, so there's, a lot, uh, there's enough space that, that many images can be around at, at mm-hmm. any space. Mm-hmm. And he didn't say anything, but certainly anything that has been, you know, that has that has already demonstrated itself to have been possible to see those images would be out there. So um, the image of the image that Cicero says he saw of Cassius or the image of Julius Caesar's ghost or whatever, that's there today, right yeah, now. Right. It right. has not yes. dissipated. Yes. Yeah. In, in his model, that's, that would be exactly what he's saying. And so, like, if you can kind of close your eyes and get a an image of of the ghost you can see you know in your imagination see that he would be saying you decided to see that and that image made its way through your pores but, but i i do think i thought i thought we just read recently in fact maybe even today that the images eventually disperse though did we not read that well, yeah, just yes, because yes. yeah it, it comes and goes they they can yeah well, then you're not going to be able to summon every possible image if they eventually disperse, right? Yeah, but they recombine even by... Yeah, uh, right. Uh, that, was, that was the weird thing, and we, because this whole concept of these, these images as, uh, as integral objects, uh, that is not the case. The, their particles are just moving due to the way they're admit, uh, uh, emitted in, a, in an orderly way and eventually get scattered, so that is not the case. But in his concept... These images exist, eventually disperse, but it didn't tell whether it goes, how quickly it goes. It doesn't go necessarily very quickly. So there uh, will still be images around. So uh, uh, And, and uh, he also says because after scattering, these fine image particles do not disappear. They are around, so they can combine again to images which are spontaneously formed. Yes, right. And of those images, which are spontaneous form, we then see those in, in sleep, which match our passages. I certainly can see that as clearly as what he's saying for some phenomena. Now, what I, I'm just not sure that that explains all mental phenomena, but that's something that uh, everybody will have to pursue. We're about to become long for another week in a row, which is, I guess, a good thing. <laughs> we have a lot to say. Well, let's cl- let's look at that last passage. If you know, I, I was I really expected us to spend most of our time talking about our pets and what we see them doing when they're asleep, and how maybe you know dogs and cats, cats especially, run around like they see things that are not there. I expected us to spend most of our time talking about things like that. So at least I want to mention it because I think that's a very uh, I don't know what the right word is cute aspect of this section of passages to talk about what animals do when they're sleeping. Yeah. What do you and, draw and people from do that too. You know, people yeah. will have, we call parasomnia, sleepwalking, sleep talking. Uh, what is that? Uh, there's an REM behavior oh, disorder. Goodness. What is it called? Uh, oh, I've heard REM that. behavioral sleep disorder, where usually during dream sleep, your, your limbs are supposed to be, you lose muscle tone the way, you know, Lucretius described it, not because your soul is leaving you, but you lose muscle tone. But in REM sleep behavior disorder, you act out in your dreams and you can actually uh, hurt yourself or your your bed partner thrashing around in your sleep. And and, and unfortunately, it can it can be a early sign of uh, neurologic pending neurologic problems like some kinds of dementias. Yeah, but from what I read. But when we normally have this sleep movement, you know, there may be pathological, pathological cases which are associated with, with a normal dream state. But there is this deep sleep dream state of which we don't have any memory. But it is in those deep sleep phases that this uh, sleep talking, sleep walking. All oh, right, stage like four sleep. Yeah, right. That's different from REM sleep. Yes. Yeah. 
and I used to sleep talk so much when I was a kid that my dad threatened at one point to tie a string around my toe <laughs> and run it across the hall into their bedroom so he could tweak it and wake me up because I would be waking up the house blathering about you know whatever. But so it's more common in kids, but sometimes adults can do it too. Those are things we ought to be talking about. Maybe we'll come back to that next week because talking in your sleep, uh, walking in your sleep, that's probably yeah, related yeah. to this topic as well. Yeah, yeah, seem to be. I don't have any uh, pets. I'm allergic, but um, you don't. Okay, well, I know do this too. <laughs> people do it. I mean, you see, I, I've seen many times with the dogs that have been around me that when they're sleeping, they'll start run. They'll be lying down, but their their legs will start running as if they're running. And I've seen the sniffing and stuff that he talks about as well with dogs. And, of course, like I say, cats, I think you could probably just spend a whole hour talking about if you were a cat lover, you'd have all sorts of examples of them doing crazy things that act as if they're hallucinating or sleepwalking. More, uh, Charles, anything there? I'm a cat person. You're a cat person? <laughs> Your cats, they do very strange things. Mm-hmm. Okay, well... Maybe we ought to begin to come to a conclusion for today. I, I intend to put some uh, to, to make some posts in this thread at least and try to draw some participation from other people because I think it's an interesting question as to how how far Epicurus intended this to go, intended this theory to go in, in applying this uh, in relation to memory and so forth or if there is a memory theory within Epicurus aside from this. But let's begin to come to a conclusion today. So Martin – Concluding thoughts. Uh, no comment. Okay. Charles. Mm, no, not really. Okay. Well, if Elaine says something that spurs you to think of something else, then we can come back to you. But <laughs> Elaine. Um, I just, I, I think the the high level thing is that he is trying to explain sleep and dreams in a non supernatural material way. And right. just because he didn't get the details right doesn't mean that it wasn't a valiant and interesting effort. Right, right. I, I, I completely agree with that. I think that's the place to leave the discussion for the day because everything we're doing is continuing to go down this road of non-supernatural explanations of the way things are. Mm-hmm. And some succeed better than others, but it's so important that we have non-supernatural understandings of things that that's the point. So, anything else for today? I don't think so. Okay, well, with that, then we'll close and come back in another week or so. So, thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks, bye. bye.